Um, so we're going to kind of get started on this, give people a few more minutes to kind of trickle in. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Henry Johnston. I'm the owner of Johnston and Williams Funeral Home in both Ellensburg and Cleella. And we're going to do a fun little presentation this evening entitled The History of Roslyn's Undertakers. And so I want to talk a little bit first about kind of the, the roots and the history of uh, undertaking in the upper county. So let's preface this with prior to 1900, when somebody died, everything was taken care of in the home. The family would wash the body, they would build their own coffin, they would take it to the cemetery on the, on the uh, horse and buggy, and it was all done by people. Then undertakers came along. And there's research indicates that as early as 1892, there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Fowle who operated as an undertaker uh, when a mine explosion killed 45 miners. <coughs> mine explosions up here were not uncommon. They happened very, very frequently. And that's why, from what I can tell in my research, is um, Rosalind moved to the more modern model of what we, what we know as a funeral home now, where the bodies are brought back and prepared at the funeral home because of these mine explosions. So, at some point, Mr. Foe skinned town. He owed rent, and he left his undertaking equipment behind. And that begins our story, Adam and Stokes. So let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about Adam and Stokes. So Anthony Stokes was a miner, and in 1892 he rethought his career choice. And there was a mine explosion, also killed his brother-in-law, gentleman by the name of John Foster. And so he partnered with local businessman William Bill Adam to build a large two-story building downtown, which became known as the Stoves Building. And this right here, everybody know where the Boston <coughs> Post Office is? Yeah. Yeah. This right here, that's the, where the post office is right now. A little space, and then this one right here is what was known as the Stoves Building. And so they built this building. There's going to be a drugstore in the front. There was space upstairs for lodge meetings. Roslyn's known you go up to the cemeteries, every lodge has a cemetery. And so Roslyn was known for having lots and lots of lodge meetings. WOF, you know, you name it. And so that's what the space upstairs was for. And so they were in the back of the stoves building to Mr. Fall. And so services during that time were pretty much almost always held at the church. The concept of a quote unquote chapel service really didn't come around until the 1930s. <coughs> And so, when Mr. Foes kept town, Stoves became licensed as a funeral director and an embalmer, and Bill Adam became licensed as a funeral director. <clears throat> now, let's, let's preface this with what the education requirements were back in those days. I'm pretty sure you did a mail-in test and you got your license. There was no mortuary school, there was not a lot of this that went around. And so they continued to operate the mortuary out of the back of the Stoves building. Now, this is where we start to put the family history together. <coughs> Anthony Stoves was married to Eliza Stewart, and they had one daughter, Margaret. Remember that. Some years later, they also uh, adopted Anthony Jr., known as Tony, uh, following the death of Stoves' sister, Sarah Alice. So here's a family photo. Everybody likes to get old, old historic family photos. So you put a face with the name. And so Adam and Stoves were men of many trades. Um, the drugstore pharmacy was going to be the original business plan. We're pretty sure they never intended on becoming undertakers. Um, and interestingly enough, they came to own the telephone company in a similar fashion as they did the undertaking part. Some young hotshot came into town from Portland, Oregon, set up the phone system, placed the switchboard in the Stoves Building drugstore. So that person eventually gave up, skipped town. We noticed some common threads, owed back rent, left their equipment behind. <clears throat> and so for a long time before the, it was a catch-22 because they couldn't raise the rates until the, the service was improved and they couldn't improve the service unless they raised the rates. So um, until they could employ paid operators, the phone system in Roslyn operated and somebody was working as a clerk at the drugstore, usually between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Can you imagine only being able to make phone calls during those hours? <laughs> And I want to point out a real interesting thing about Bill Adam and his influence on funeral customs uh, that still carry on to this day. In 1909, Bill Adam Jr. Uh, was 
killed in a hunting accident. And he was a volunteer firefighter for the Roslyn Volunteer Fire Department. <coughs> now Bill Sr. was mayor of Roslyn at the time, and he instructed the fire department to construct, at that time was what they called a hose cart, that they would put Junior's casket on to take him to the cemetery. Uh, and that hose cart would be used until they got a motorized fire truck. And this tradition has carried on for 114 years. How many of you that are from Roslyn have seen us come through town with a casket on the back of the fire truck. It happens occasionally. And uh, they still, the fire department still uses their 1936 Chevrolet fire engine to convey the retired firefighters. And so this was a picture that was uh, given to me uh, to use by uh, Carrie Newberry. This was late 60s, maybe early 70s. That's the same fire truck we use today. This is a picture from the Davies family archive of the original postcard. And then this is a picture that was taken in 2019 uh, in memory of my friend Jeff Rushman. He was actually one of the first people that I really became friends with when I moved to Ellensburg. And this was his funeral procession in 2019. And so, early 1900s saw the construction of this building as the mortuary. And it, the concept of the funeral chapel started. You'd have the funeral at the funeral home. And it was known by a few different names over the years. So it started as Adam and Stoves, and then it was known as the Stoves Babies Mortuary, and eventually became known as the Roslyn Funeral Home. <coughs> well, let's talk about my favorite guy. <laughs> and I say that because Larry left so many letters and notes and records and all of the old record books. You just read through them and you can't help but like the guy. Uh, Lawrence Morgan Davies was born in Wilkinson, Washington, March 27, 1900. He spent his early years there before the family moved to Cleveland. Now, he fudged the date of his birth to join the Navy at the age of 17 during World War I. After his discharge, he came back to Cleveland and graduated in 1920. So this is where the family tie-in comes together. Larry <coughs> married Margaret, the daughter of Anthony Stoves, and they moved to Portland where they opened a jewelry store. So see, Larry's family was a, uh, were jewelers by trade, and that's what he had intended on going into. Now, that venture didn't take off like they hoped. They tried everything. Margaret was an accomplished piano player, and they would have all sorts of things happen at the store. She'd play the piano, and they'd try to get people in. just didn't quite take off like they, they had hoped. And so they came back, and Larry went to work for his father-in-law here at the funeral home. He passed both of his licensing exams, without having attended mortuary school. It was still quasi-optional at the time, but he did it without having to, to go to mortuary school. Now, in talking with older colleagues in the state of Washington, I made some phone calls. Those that still remember Larry, remember him um, for his attention to detail in the way he presented loved ones. He was very meticulous when it came to reconstructions, restorative art, um, and in the way he directed funerals. He was also very community focused on how he ran the business, and as I'm saying, you flip through the old records, there's not a lot of signed contracts in these things, there's not a lot of receipts. What we find is a lot of letters that are very polite, but saying, hey, I did a favor for you, I need you to, you know, pay me at some point. And one of those is up here, where he says, he wrote to this guy, he says, we know you to be fair and honest, and that you'll understand our position when placed squarely before you. At your request and upon your uh, selection, we furnished all of the services, merchandise, and equipment necessary for the funeral and burial of Mr. J.P. Brown. You assured us that the obligation would be met. There's still a balance to us owing of $50. Now, this was in 1942, so that's a, a good chunk of money. Uh, we look to you for payment uh, as to our transaction, transaction was with you. Uh, you know that we have not tried to force payment. We trusted you then, we trust you now. <coughs> we need the money. <laughs> I would appreciate very much to have you make payment, be it ever so small, each month until paid. And if you feel there's others that should help you with this uh, obligation, uh, get a hold of them, basically. But your obligation was with us. You can sign that. This has become my new standard collection letter with folks. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it works. Because they get it. And then they come in and pay their bill. And so, um, like I said, we found he did most funerals on a handshake. He let people pay. Some of the old record books show $5 payments over the course of a couple of years. And in looking at the records, too, sometimes he would strike out. If he left holding a funeral bill for somebody in the family, they'd call him again, and he'd go and do it again. 
Not something you find in funeral, funeral business, hardly anymore. So Anthony Stoves died in 1932. He left his half of the business to his children, Margaret and Tony. So when Bill Adam died in 1936, he left his half of the businesses. And when I say businesses, I mean funeral home and telephone company. Remember, the telephone company is still in the mix here. Um, and thus gave Margaret and Larry 75% combined ownership. Okay? So Larry tried to continue to improve the phone service in Roslyn. It was never any battle with public utilities. Hey, I need to raise the rates so I can improve the service. Well, your service sucks. We're not going to let you raise rates until you improve it. So more often than not, the funeral home actually kind of subsidized the phone company in Roslyn for many years. So ultimately, Larry and Margaret brought out Tony's remaining 25%, um, and then they became the sole owners. Tony moved, he actually went and had a very, very uh, long and prosperous career as a funeral director in Bellevue. This in here. Oh. So then they sold the phone company to Harold and Marion Weiss, which turned it into Inland Networks, which is next door and is still owned by the Weiss family today. That's how that started. So. So 1972 comes around, Larry's got some health concerns, so he sells the business and assets of the Roslyn Funeral Home to Earl Brown, who was owner of Brown's Funeral Chapel in Cleallum. And Brown consolidated, consolidated all of the operations down to Cleallum, and this old mortuary building was converted into a movie house in the late 1970s. So just as a bit of other history for Upper County uh, funeral history, the funeral home in Cleallum has been in that exact same location that it is down in what's called the Coleman Building, the corner of First and Harris, kind of kitty corner from <coughs> Umpqua Bank, um, since that building was constructed in 1920. The mortuary down there was originally owned and operated by a gentleman by the name of Seth Coleman. He sold it to Earl Brown. Our county coroner, Nick Henderson, is sitting here. Nick actually worked for Earl Brown back in the 70s. Uh, those green cabinets are still there, by the way. <laughs> And he operated the funeral home until 1986 when he sold it to Paul Cotton, who had the funeral home in Ellensburg, which was Cotton Chapel previous to that, even some funeral home previous to that, Honeycutt. And that's the Ellensburg side of our operation. And then the firms have operated together under one ownership umbrella since that time. And the reason is, is because the math, with, with the way things are changing in the funeral business, and the, the, it just, you can't, Cleon just can't have its own standalone funeral home, but I assure you, if it could, if that place could stand on its own two feet, I would just be up here all the time, and I love that here. So from 1990 through 2022, Cleon Mortuary was known as Cascade Funeral Home, and then today it's known as Johnston & Williams. Uh, I changed the name when I bought it a couple years ago. I want to give a round of applause uh, from the audience. We have members of the Davies family with us here uh, this evening. And so as I mentioned previously, Margaret's brother Tony worked in Bellevue for Butterworth Manning Mashmore Funeral Home. He passed away in 1985. Larry and Margaret's son Terry, who's with us this evening, uh, began working at Hill Funeral Home in Puyallup in 1966. Terry and his wife, Lou, they named Pays. Everybody know where Pays Road is? That's the family. Became the owners in 1977, and they retired in 2018. Now, Terry and Lou's daughter, Deborah, is a fourth-generation funeral director. She worked at Hill Funeral Home for over 25 years before retiring at the same time as her folks. Terry and Lou's youngest son, David, also fourth-generation funeral director in Balmer, worked in the family business. And Deborah's daughter, April, uh, worked in the office at Hill Funeral Home for 25 years, and she's recently shifted years. And I've got to tell you, and again, talking with colleagues, there is not a family in this state um, that I believe has been more dedicated to the care of their communities and to the others than the Davies family. And so I'd like to give them another round of applause. And so how did I get wrangled up with the Davies family? Did I just call them up one day? No, I got to take, I had the honor of taking care of somebody in their family. And that would be Terry's brother, uh, Lawrence Anthony, also known as Mick Sr. Um, and we took care of him this summer. And on our way from the funeral home in Cleallum up to the Roslyn Masonic Cemetery, we brought the funeral procession by this building one more time. So now a little bit about the film. I get asked, all the time. God, Henry, what's your life like? What, what you, what's your job like? 
this movie sums it up, and it does so scarily. Throughout the course of this film, the main character, played by Dan Aykroyd, uh, plays a gentleman by the name of Harry Sultanfuss, who owns a funeral parlor. And throughout this, we see he's, he has to handle the embalming and the funeral for his high school shop teacher. He takes care of a local minister's wife. He takes care of all sorts of things that, that he does. And as you watch this, if you, if you can see me in some of these scenes as Harry, welcome to my world. Uh, the family dinner scene, which you will see, is uh, if you were sitting a fly on the wall in our dining room some night, you'd, you'd just pull your eyes because it's very, very accurate. And so there's also a very critical scene in this that I believe, and I'm going to try to keep this as generic as possible, but in my defense, the film is 30 years old, so if you don't know how it ends, I'm not trying to ruin it. But. Uh, Veda, the young girl lead character, was, was told something very devastating about her friend Thomas J. But she refused or was unable to process that news properly until she saw with her own eyes what she was told. And then she was able to fully let out her grief emotionally in the process of healing. Pay very close attention to that scene. Very, very close attention to that scene because it's a reminder for all of us that when somebody dies, the step that she goes through is very very, very important. And so a little bit about Johnston and Williams. We're a locally owned and operated funeral home, Mercatitas County owned, Mercatitas County based, locations in Ellensburg and Cleon. I'm the guy, I'm the Johnston, Williams is dead. Uh, so I, I wanted to keep his name. <laughs> I kept his name on because interestingly enough, he was born in St. Mary's, Idaho, where I was, and I figured when I went to change the name, what are the chances that, that two locals from North Idaho are going to end up saving, owning the same funeral home in the same town? So it was a, a toss back to him. And this is one of many different presentations that I have ready to give. And so if you've got a group that you want me to speak at, Rotary, Kiwanis, Quilting Group, your coffee club, anybody member of a wine club, because I'll come, I'll come speak at that uh, too. <laughs> Um, just let me know. So if you want to grab a quick, anybody want to grab a quick picture of this before I advance the slides, so you have my contact information, you're welcome to. And that'll give Joe time to navigate upstairs. To, yeah, you ready? I think we're pretty close. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Terry. Uh, I'm just wondering if I could take a minute. Yeah, and please. Have a little addenda to what you said. <clears throat> 1932, when my granddad, Anthony Stove, died. We were in the middle of a bad, I mean a bad depression. And all over the country felt it. And we felt it no less here in Roslyn. The idea that when Anthony Stoves died, there was 3,200, and this is easy to remember because this is the same as the year. There were $3,200 worth. This is in the middle of the depression, owed on funerals, as you said. Fifty dollars of that, after Anthony died, were collected, and nothing more. So imagine what it was like for the people who owed that money. But it, it's an interesting mindset that said, Anthony's dead, but there's a debt we don't have to pay anymore. But I, I'm not shaming anybody. I'm telling you how bad it was in 1932. You had to reach for reasons that some bill might be more important than another. But it was tough. It was tough on every level. The entrepreneurs, the people that made this town run, suffered. And the people that owed those money, that money suffered just as much. So I mention that just to, to put this in perspective. We think we've got bad times now. Imagine what it was like when you faced that in 1932. That was tough. Thank you. Yes, enjoy the show.